Hello, I'm Val Ross from the Anne Frank Trust. I'm here in Derry this week with the History for Today exhibition, working with a group of volunteers from the community to train the exhibition and invite visitors to encounter Anne's story. Can I just uh, say um, a huge thanks to Susan for um, making this project happen and I should also like to mention the Hollywall Trust and the Diversity Community Partnership and the Garden of Reflection project in particular. Um, I have received a very, very warm welcome here in Derry. It's my first visit uh, and I have to say it will not be my last. I'm looking forward, as Susan said, to developing a sustainable partnership um, with schools um, in the locality and indeed with communities. We believe um, Anne Frank's life and legacy has something very, very contemporary and current to say to each one of us in this city, in this room. Um, and we're going to explore a little bit today about what that, what that relevance is and what her legacy is. And I'm delighted um, that we have uh, St Mary's Lumen and Lisneal School Guides with us. Um, the young people with whom I have worked since Monday have been fantastic and I just I don't know how many teachers we have in the room here from those schools but can I just commend your pupils they have been absolutely amazing they've been put on the spot they've been invited to train um, to guide an exhibition they have risen to the challenge and yesterday they put their guiding skills to the test so thank you all very much for making that happen um, I'm also very delighted and to draw attention to the mission statement um, of the Garden of Reflection and I've picked out a few words in particular which I think really sum up the work of the Anne Frank Trust. They are creating a new reality, working together to build a new society based on the celebration of diversity and that really is what Anne's story is for me, for those of us who work um, for the Anne Frank Trust UK. I'm just going to throw this out to the audience. We've got a lovely diverse group of people of all ages. I want to ask you, what do you see? Now I know my guides have done this with me, but I'm hoping that other people will just feel empowered to tell me what they see on the screen. Ordinary people, in exa exactly. Ordinary, normal people. A young girl enjoying family life, holidays, games, walk with mum and dad on a fine afternoon. A young girl who was persecuted and died for no other reason than that she was Jewish. Well, what is our mission? Our mission is to draw on the power of Anne's life and diary to challenge prejudice to reduce hatred, encourage people to embrace positive attitudes, responsibility and respect for each other. And the work that we do, as Susan mentioned, focuses predominantly but not exclusively in working with young people. Because we believe, as Otto Frank believed, that young people are the key to our future. And it is through building positive <coughs> attitudes and relationships um, at within that age group that we can see our societies transformed. We work with organisations and communities to confront the dangers of racism, marginalisation and discrimination. We work across the UK, we've got partner organisations in Europe and in South America and in South Africa. Our approach encourages self-reflection and we ask each person who encounters Anne's story to think about what it means for them in that personal context, to encourage them to challenge prejudice, to encourage them to embrace positive attitudes, respect and responsibility towards others. Um, I wonder if um, anybody would like just to assign some labels to this girl. We've said, oops, we've said that she's a normal girl. What else could we say about this girl? Happy? Pretty? Pretty. Fragile? Fragile. Anything else? Intelligent. Intelligent. 
She's a writer, and today, if you have an opportunity to visit the exhibition, you will learn more about her. I'm, I'm assuming that most of you have heard of Anne Frank. Would that, be the, would that be the case? So we know something of her story, which is explored in some detail um, in the context of the exhibition, which itself is broken into different phases. We look at the effects and the impacts of World War I on Germany and on the rise of Nazism and dictatorship. We look at the Second World War and how that impacted on the Frank family, but not just the Frank family. We have to uh, commemorate and acknowledge all those others who were persecuted at that time because of who they were. We look also in the exhibition at the, the final solution and the intention of the Nazis to rid Europe of all Jews. We think about what, these, uh, what this history means for us today. The exhibition is called Anne Frank, A History for Today. So it's not a history for yesterday, it's a history for today. It's something from which we can draw lessons. And we think about what it means in our own context. Now, each community is different, but we all have our own struggles and we all have our own tensions. Um, here are some actual words that we could use to describe that girl, Anne. <coughs> She's all of these things and so many more. She's a girl full of potential whose life we know tragically ended in March 1945, just a few months short of her 16th birthday. But for the Nazis, all that concerned them was that she was Jewish. They did not see anything else about her. Anne is one of 1.5 million Jewish children who were murdered because they were Jewish. We use Anne as a, as a lens to reflect on the enormity of that tragedy and to prejudice and discrimination and hatred which led to that place. Some of you may be familiar with Anne's writing and I know that yesterday with our guides we, we looked at some of the quotations from Anne's diary. She was a very, very accomplished writer. She started her diary on her 13th birthday. She received the famous red tartan check notebook from her father. She knew she was going to get a diary. And she started writing in it. And she wanted to confide <coughs> all her innermost thoughts and desires to it. She wanted it to become her best friend, and it did for those two plus years that she was in hiding. She writes as a teenager, now I know we've got lots of teenagers here, um, and I know the rest of us have all been teenagers, so it's something that we can very much still identify with. And she writes about the struggles of growing up. She writes about her <coughs> ambitions and her aspirations. She writes about her hopes for the future and her belief her belief that we all have potential, that we can all accomplish good, and that we can all make a difference. Um, perhaps we could ask our guides to come and speak to us just now. I think we need to give you a mic, Blaheen. Is this right? The mic of power. Okay. Um, well, anyway. Um, I got involved with this project through my school and at first I have to admit I was a bit apprehensive because I myself am half German and I always find this period of time to be very difficult for me to learn about because I always get extremely emotional and find it very difficult to learn about. But since uh, the project started and I've been learning more about Anne herself. I've been able to see that by the fact that she's very relatable to anyone and everyone because you're learning about her feelings and her emotions and her thoughts and her inner self. So it's this part of her that everyone has in themselves and it's her private, personal being. And uh, because that's so relatable, I think it's amazing how much inspiration in these last few days that I've gotten from her, just from learning about this. And I'm personally very honored to have learned to see such a horrible time, to be able to take something good from that and inspiration from that. So that's what I've learned from this so far. And I'm really grateful that I have been able to, so. Thanks, Lee. Um, 
Yesterday we were doing a test where we asked uh, the other people who were learning to deter questions and one of the questions was um, how is Anne important to you and I was answered Anne is an example of how bad conditions can be can cause society to be controlled and manipulated by extremists and that we have severe consequences and I think Anne's an example of the consequences when something goes wrong there's usually destruction that follows it and that Anne is kind of like that light and she shows us that though things are bad, she can still be happy and ambitious and hopeful throughout it. So that's what I've learned. Thank you. Well done. Um, Anne's story has like really motivated me to stand up for people if I see bullying or racism, because it's still very current today, and that's what being involved in all of this has really brought forward to me, how important it still is. So. Thank you for that. Thank you. I think what I've learned in these past couple of days has really like helped me see that even if you're going through a bad time, there's always something to look forward to. And it has kind of motivated me to try better in everything that I'm doing. Brilliant. Thank you all very much indeed. I'm incredibly proud of, of these young people. And we have a couple of guides who sadly, um, Amy and Shannon, who sadly are, are ill today. But as I said earlier, I would like very much to commend your young people for uh, the fantastic commitment and enthusiasm and their perception. Um, and being able to stand up here, it's quite a tall order. Believe me, I'm still shaking. Um, so it's a tall order to ask them to come up and address you, many of whom are strangers. So thank you very much. Well done. Super. At the Anne Frank Trust, we make no apologies for using Anne's story to challenge attitudes and behaviour. Um, even if today we are unlikely to experience the same collision of events that brought Nazism and the Holocaust. In current times, there is great disaffection with political systems and in e economic instability. And the memory and knowledge of Anne's short life and terrible death should remain with us a perpetual warning from history. And that's what we use, that's what's, what drives us, thinking about the lessons to be learnt um, from Anne's story. I want to um, throw this open to you now and ask a question or two. So I wonder if I can ask you what the relevance of Anne Frank's story is to our communities today. No, okay, just, I think we always need to be on our guard and I do disagree what you just said. I think there's real dangers from the far okay. right today and uh, also from our own government to be honest, mm -hmm. unfortunately. Uh, I'll give an example, I was involved with campaigning Five years ago, we did a fundraiser. There was an attack on 200 Romanians in Belfast. They were terrorised out of their houses. They had to flee for a church to a church, another church in Belfast. For three days, they were again terrorised in the church. You know, they had iron bars going through the windows, all kinds of. Gosh. But you know, I think the biggest thing there as well was the, pol the political people in Northern Ireland said nothing. They did nothing. And I'd say it's like Anne's story, and it's the story here, and it's the story today. Yeah. Was you acquiesce through silence yeah. by actually not saying anything? And to be honest, you know, constantly in the press now, it's UKIP and Cameron and the Labour Party was about immigrants, immigrants, immigrants. And I think they are staring hatred. And through the, through the, what they say is people get hurt, people get attacked, and they don't speak. They're not. It's not in my name what they're saying about immigrants. It's not in mm. my name. And one thing with my family, my uncle George died. He was at Auschwitz. He actually he was actually burying bodies at Auschwitz, and he died of typhoid. And he he was there in the Second World War. He was fighting uh, fascism, and he didn't die. To, so, so what our politicians today can attack immigrants, the weakest, uh, most vulnerable sections of society. I think they're a disgrace. And to be honest, I can only say it's despicable the form of politics that we're now witnessing uh, in Britain today throughout Europe. And I think there is a danger that, and you've already seen in parts of Ukraine and Europe, uh, Holland and other countries that the far right are emerging again. You know, we always need to keep on our guard. 
you know, and it's when people don't speak out, it's when people don't organise against fascism, against the far right. Unfortunately, it's the governments that are supposed to protect the people and before the people, but unfortunately they don't. I think they're, I think they're disgraceful. And it's not in my name, I'm sure it's not in our name, this, this anti-immigrant thing, that's, that's all I can say on, on that. But, uh, but I'll always speak out, I promise. This is now, I, I'm, my name's Dave Michael, I'm an author. Wherever I am, I will always speak out about it, you know, uh, because it is life and death. People are getting hurt. You know, people are getting killed because of the, word, these, the, the words of hatred, the politics of hatred. It's the lowest of the low. And I thought we fought a Second World War to stop fascist ideology, fascist ideas. But unfortunately, it seems to be creeping into our mainstream politics in, in Britain, throughout Europe and the, and the world. You know, and unfortunately, it's almost history can repeat itself, or it is repeating itself. There's a global recession. Global recessions, bank collapses, usually equals equals discrimination of, of small groups, small fringe groupings, uh, and wars, and the rise of the far right. And I think we're actually seeing that. And I think we need to be on our guard, really on our guard in the, in the times that we're in. I think we all have to be vigilant, and I think we would we would say that, that yeah. we, we we have to be vigilant, and we have to speak up for what is right and morally right. And just where where we see that see that need, and certainly, um, I think we're going to be looking, or Susan will be um, will be talking about the Anne Frank Declaration later today or or on Saturday, which is a statement that you know we we make a personal commitment to stand up for what is right and speak out against what is unfair and wrong. The commitment then goes on to say, I will try to defend those who cannot defend themselves and I will strive for a world in which our differences will make no difference, a world in which everyone is treated fairly and has an equal chance in life. And certainly that's what we take from Anne's story, that's what we take as the, uh, as, as the warning, and that's something that we are committed to, and, and, I, and I know that you all are committed to it, and that's why you've brought us um, to be alongside you to, um, today and for the next month um, through the exhibition. Is there a branch of the Anne Frank Trust in Israel? Um, I don't believe so. Why not? I, we are a British-based uh, charity. Um, there's an Anne Frank House in Amsterdam. There's lots of international work going on. Um, there are partner organi organisations in Argentina and in Berlin and in South Africa, but I'm not aware that there is anything specific um, in Israel. Well, I was looking at the exhibition. Um, I have the same feeling that we are in a dangerous situation in Europe today. Mm -hmm. and, you know, when you, you see how uh, in the 1930s there was actually a lot of support for the Nazis and they were voted into power. And I don't imagine most of their supporters had any idea how far things were going to go. Um, but there's a lot of uh, things going on. Like even in France, there's some people that are um, you know, they have a large North African um, population and there's some people using racist theories mm -hmm. against them saying that uh, the North Africans are more likely <coughs> to carry a gene for sickle cell anemia and that that's putting a drain on the health service. But, you know, every group of people has certain diseases, that, genetic diseases that they carry. Uh, you know, they happen to latch on to this one particular one. Um, in Ireland and in Britain, we have the same scapegoating of mm -hmm. uh, individual Jews or local Jewish communities being blamed for the present activities of Israel and Gaza, of individual Muslims being blamed for uh, suicide bombers, <coughs> immigrants being blamed mm -hmm. for uh, housing uh, crisis or uh, rising prices or lower employment and so on, and the, you know, to find a scapegoat. And what I find particularly alarming is that there's a danger of this be having an influence actually on government because uh, you see how the UKIP, which is an anti-immigrant party, is, is gaining popularity and people actually moving from the Conservative Party into it. So, you know, I, I do think we're in a dangerous situation mm. and, and we have to be aware because we can see from the recent past mm. how far things can go, how how bad they can get. Um, if we reflect um, perhaps a little bit more, a little bit more um, locally, does Anne's story help make, help make a difference? Does it bridge divides? 
Well, it should do, but I'm not a teenager, as you can see. Um, <laughs> most of most of my life, all of my life, we've been living under something similar. Mm. In fact, our community was known as Verma. Nobody spoke out much about that until the Civil Rights March yeah. started in So all of my life I've experienced. I mean, I'm going to be, I'm going to be honest here. You know, I'm, you probably de detect from my accent that I'm Scottish. Um, I live in England. I'm not. Curry me yogurt. Thank you, Bruna. What was that? <laughs> Sorry. Curry me yogurt. I said. Um, uh. So I mean, I am new to your context, and I'm I'm here also to learn. And I believe that Anne's story uh, <coughs> does provide ways of reaching a out across divides. And I know we've done that successfully in in many many places in communities across England and Wales where there is uh, division and uh, confusion and where one community or the other is scapegoated or, or marginalised. Um, I spoke with Gillian Walls this morning, um, who's our director and um, as is so supportive of this particular project and she drew to my attention the fact that we've actually been in Armagh and we've been in Belfast on a number of occasions um, and she spoke of her experience and her hope because Anne does transcend class, culture and creed. She's a girl and we, you know, we said she's a normal, ordinary girl. She's somebody in her family. She's our sister or our niece or she's somebody we've all been. Um, and there is a way of um, bridging divides. There is a way of uh, respecting and honouring diversity and difference, but also by looking at her and learning from her, <coughs> there is a way of um, respecting what um, humanity is, you know, the aspirations that we all share, you know, for health and for happiness and to live in freedom and peace. And she writes extensively in the diary about those things. Where do, where do you think she got those ideas that uh, have been on the board there, uh, very positive ideas about everybody can help change the world for the better? Everybody has a great potential inside them. I was wondering, you know, <coughs> where, as, as a young girl in a crisis period, you know, did she get those ideas? Or well, that's not a question that can be answered. Um, you know, we could all we could all sort of um, uh, suppose where they might have come from. I mean, Anne lived for more than two years in a, in an annex, as we and, you know, and we'll learn more about the story through the exhibition. You know, with eight, there were eight people in the hiding place. Um, conditions were, were difficult, of course they were. Uh, there was a huge threat, there was great fear, but there's also optimism and she's, um, the, the diary um, is, is written of a, as a young woman growing up with all the turmoil that that brings, but also these moments of uh, clarity or a philosophical insight, um, inspiration and hope. Um, and certainly that's what we would encourage people to um, take from the story, you know, the, 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 the warning from history, but also the hopefulness of a better future. Um, and that is indeed what her father hoped for. The diary was published in 1947, um, two years after Otto returned from the concentration camps to find that his wife and uh, daughters were, had died. Um, it took him some time to come to the decision to publish the diary but he decided that almost he, he owed it to Anne to honour her memory um, and, and her aspiration was to be a published author, to be a journalist actually, for those of you in the audience who write, she wanted to be a journalist. So he took it upon himself and that must have been an incredibly difficult thing to do, to share his daughter with the world. <coughs> but he was driven for it because he, he believed um, that the, through the diary, he talks about it being a force for good. And that's what we harness. We harness the lessons and the warnings, but we also harness that potential for people and situations to change. We've all got that potential, um, but perhaps those who have most potential are the young people in our communities. And that's not to burden them, but it's to say, you know, um, you are the future, 
you can you can shape and change the world in which you live and don't let anybody tell you that you can't it's you you have the potential to make a significant um, difference yes how many people have read the diary yeah quite quite a few how many people have um, watched um, a drama yeah a few more I would commend the diary um, to you as young people. Um, do any of you write diaries? Okay. I, this brings me on to something that I, I was going to uh, mention a little bit later. We've actually launched um, a writing campaign this year. I mean, obviously, Anne was a writer who wrote probably the most, the best known diary in the world. Um, it's been translated into more than 70 languages. Um, and at one time it ranked next to the Bible in terms of um, its readership. I'm not quite sure where it stands on the bestseller list now, but it is up there um, as being one of the books that has been most widely read. It has transformed lives. Nelson Mandela refers to the diary. Um, somebody smuggled it into him in Robben Island. And he has been interviewed and he spoke about the diary being, he, of him deriving huge comfort from the diary. Here was a girl incarcerated because of her, because she was Jewish, living under extreme circumstances. And he talks about the comfort that he derived um, from reading about her and from her hopefulness. So this year, on the 12th of June, 2014, we launched uh, something called the Genera Generation Diary. And our intention is to create, so I'm going to skip through a few slides. Our intention is to create the world's biggest digital diary. The campaign is open to 13 to 15 year olds because those were the years during which Anne Frank wrote. So if it's something you can do in school, it's something you can do at home. You can write a short diary piece. You can write a letter to your future self, thinking about what it is that you would want to achieve. You can upload a picture or a video, but what we want by the 12th of June 2015 is to have an account of young people's experience today. Now, Anne wrote about growing up. She wrote about struggles and quarrels and arguments with her mother. <coughs> she wrote about food. She wrote about boys. She wrote about these big philosoph philosophical things, about hopes for the future. So what we're encouraging young people to do now is to share these thoughts with us. And next year we will publish, we will have an online diary, but we will al also publish um, a diary for 365 days from 2000, June 2014 to June 2015. So I hope you're up for it. Actually, we've got some resource packs for teachers. Um, and we would encourage you to um, make your commitment um, by getting involved with the Generation Diary campaign. Thinking about Otto, we talked about what sort of drove Otto to publish the diary. Um, Otto received many, many, many thousands of letters and he answered everyone, he and his wife answered everyone. Otto remarried um, and he and his wife answered everyone. And he was committed to believing that Anne's book would have an effect on the rest of people's lives. He wanted the book to help people work towards unity and peace and indeed he himself did a lot of work in terms of reconciliation and peace and in the early 1950s before the Anne Frank Museum was officially opened had groups of young people from Germany coming to stay and meet other young people from other parts of Europe to have conversation and to find ways of bridging bridging gaps and breaking down stereotypes and misjudgments. So um, I'm going to open myself up for 
some questions, I think. Yes. Uh, I didn't get the chance to answer the question. Oh, sorry, I moved on from the relevance today. We can go back to that. Um, in terms of uh, the relevance of Anne's story to us, the thing that everybody brings home to me is that when you talk about racial and cultural politics, there's a tendency uh, to fall back onto, um, onto uh, the abstract. And what sort of the idea you know, of Anne Frank does is that it cuts through that and it concentrates it into you know, that, um, you know, into that person. And it makes me think that in terms of you know, here in Northern Ireland, that that um, trying to uh, to uh, to uh, to uh, 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 to uh, to uh, to uh, to, uh, to, uh, uh, to engineer, you know, uh, to uh, an architect, uh, you know, a settlement, um, you know, on that level, you know, the, you know. You know, you know, in terms of you know, the abstractions, it's sort of flawed that um, that Anne kind of uh, she she uh, <coughs> uh, she uh, re represents a kind of person person based approach. To uh, what peace and reconciliation mm -hmm. is, you know, that, that you know, like it isn't a grand plan. You know, it's a combination mm -hmm. of uh, small, you know, interpersonal, uh, uh, um, uh, 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 in, in interpersonal uh, uh, interactions. And is that the way forward? Do you think? Yeah, I think it's so. the small. It's the personal. It's those <coughs> interactions. And I mean, that's certainly our experience of working with Anne. It's the small. It's the personal. It's the girl. It's how we can relate to that girl and how we can reflect um, on her life and reflect on discrimination and reflect on responsibility. Yes, um, she also displayed a heightened awareness of her situation and that she was incarcerated and her life actually became a microcosm yes. for a larger society. Yes. And taught us how to um, philosophize and crisis and things like that. And it, it would teach you really to take time to step back and reflect and see the bigger picture. Yes, I think so. And it's something that we're very, very keen on is for that personal, personal reflection. It's about how you encounter this story. You know, we know, we, we know the facts, but it's about how you encounter the story and how um, you embed that or, or live that. And we heard from our guides today, but uh, having only spent a little bit of time with the exhibition and getting to know um, Anne's life and the work that we do, um, they were able to describe personally what that journey has meant for them. And I think also that's really appropriate here because you are creating a garden of reflection. You're creating that space, that space of encounter, that space of um, being able to be still with yourself possibly and, 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 and look at these and look at these things. And something I wanted to tie in, uh, I don't know if you know, but Anne wrote a lot about nature. Uh, she was incarcerated for those two plus years, I'm getting my quote here. Um, she was incarcerated for those two plus years and all she could see of the outside world from the top of the, um, the secret annex, from, from the attic at the top, was a horse chestnut tree in the square below. And for that, that represented freedom and she watched the, the changing seasons through that tree. And Otto actually, um, in an interview, said that um, it was like she was a bird in a cage. That tree represented for her freedom and that freedom of nature gave her comfort. She wrote in her diary, as long as it exists, and she means the tree, how can I be sad? She found solace in the chestnut tree. So I think, it, as I say, I think it's, it's wonderful, you know, that you have created this space in this very special place. And I've, you know, been made, as I said earlier, I've been made to feel very welcome here. Um, 
and I think this is an amazing resource. And um, you know, I wish you all well with the, the partnership, the project, and the work um, which is undertaken here. And what I would like to do now, yes. Um, before we close, and you could finish your statement, but I, I wanted to make sure everybody's aware of the role that Northern Ireland and Derry in particular uh, played in, as, as a place of uh, sanctuary for some people escaping from the Nazis. Um, um, Derry, Derry specifically had about 70, almost 70 uh, people, mostly from Vienna, there was at least one from Prague, who were um, allowed uh, to come into uh, the United Kingdom and specifically to Northern Ireland mm -hmm. to help build up crafts industries here. And also a few women were just dom domestic servants, but in most cases, it was actually an active charity of people who gave them these positions uh, to help get them out of Vienna, and uh, mm -hmm. they were really guests. So um, that we had 70 people, mostly of working age, but also sometimes their parents were allowed in, or some families had a child, there were no big families. And uh, a small number actually stayed, the rest of their lives most went on to other places. They also helped build up um, crafts industries within Northern Ireland. And, you know, they, their lives were saved and they also mm -hmm. contributed to the community. Um, so Derry wasn't completely separated from you know, what happened in World War II. Um, unfortunately, some of the people who were already working here also applied to bring in other relatives mm -hmm. and dependents, uh, besides their parents who were relatives of working age. And uh, those um, applications were turned down. And, I do know that some of the people involved actually did die. Uh, some of them got out by other ways. Um, but it further highlights how many lives were saved. And um, Derry was one of the main places. There were also people in uh, other parts of Northern Ireland. Is that story widely known? Not really. Because I, I would say I would say to you that there is a real opportunity here then for you as a community. To, to do something and to share that story, to, to record that story. The Holocaust Memorial Day um, as happens every year on the 27th of January and 2015. Um, it's, a very, it's a very significant commemoration because it's 70 years since the liberation of Auschwitz. And the theme for 2015's Holocaust Memorial Day is keeping the memory alive. Mm -hmm. um, there and weren't many kinder transports, but there was uh, some that stayed on a farm in Belial that was run by the Jewish community. And, uh, and I would say that there's a, the kind of the kernel of perhaps a lovely local history project or community project there, because it's really, really important that those stories, your stories, are uh, are are recorded. You know, we could, you know we've got young people here, and I know that. You went to listen. You went to listen to a talk yesterday, didn't you, from from a Holocaust survivor? You know, it's very very important um, that that those commemorations and those stories are uh, shown uh, respect. Just yeah, to fill up a story, uh, two doors from us there was a lady called Madame Beck. She was a milliner, mm -hmm. and a few doors down from her was Pollock, the shoe people. Mm -hmm. So. All of my young years, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. we had Jews. Yes. So and that seemed, seemed quite normal. Yes, and a place of sanctuary. You said it was a place of a place of a place of sanctuary and welcome. Yeah. Madame Beck was a, a French woman, but she was she married was, to a Viennese. Uh -huh. She was a milliner. Yeah. Uh -huh. Maybe uh, some of the younger people would like to have a say rather than have the conversation yeah. dominated yeah. by the older ones. Yeah. 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 yeah, we've got too much to. Say. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Maybe we could just finish by saying if any of our younger people here, and I know that's kind of putting the focus on all the school uniforms, but if anything you'd like to say or reflect on what you've heard, um, maybe some of our young guys who I know are very confident and not afraid to speak up, <laughs> could start off playing. You're not shy of a word. Uh, no, I'm not. Mm -hmm. But. Uh, I no, think that's a very interesting story. She said she's half German, but her grandfather also was a soldier in the German army. 
So that was very significant sort of impact. Yeah, so uh, my grandfather, he was um, scripted by his teacher. He was training to be a teacher himself and was very passionate about teaching and was very passionate about uh, learning. But whenever he was in his studies to become a teacher, his, um, his own teacher signed his entire class of 25 up. He came in one day and was like, okay, I've signed you all up to join the German army. You're going to be fighting with the Nazis now. Aren't, aren't you honoured? And of course, he couldn't turn around and say, well, no, not really, to be honest with you. But um, So he was signed up, and from that class of 25, only five survived the war. But um, my dad was recently telling me uh, about a story of my grandfather uh, coming home. He was on leave, and on the train home, he um, ran into a Jewish girl with whom he'd grown up with, and uh, she was seemed quite nervous. And he was in his military uniform, and he went up to her and uh, said hello to her, and she was terrified. And she was saying, "You can't be seen with me. What are you doing here? If somebody sees you here with me, you know they know they know I'm a Jew. Nobody, this is completely unheard of. What are you doing?" And he said, "No, you're my friend, and I'm going to. I'm not going to be rude to you, and I'm." honoured to talk to you and said that and then it turned out later my my own aunt she went to Israel to talk with the woman uh, a few years back and it turned out that uh, uh, sh that was the day that she was escaping from Germany and that she was being forced to leave for her own safety and she told my aunt that uh, she herself found despite the fact she was being forced to leave her home without great comfort and hope and her faith was restored by the fact that a German soldier still took, made it out of his way and made a point of coming to greet her a Jewish person as a friend and uh, so that took, she took great inspiration from and I took great inspiration from hearing that story not only from my grandfather but from others who were fighting against the discrimination at the time so Sarah and Lisa, just your story, yes, just tell everyone about the Holocaust survivor that you met yesterday. Um, his name is Tommy. Um, he's done music talks, um, yeah. and he was in our school telling us his story and how he ended up in the same concentration camp as Anne did, and his very horrific stories from that camp, and I think that part of the story gave you an insight to what Anne went through at the end of her, once her diary cuts off very abruptly. The stories were very disturbing, and to know that she went through that after having such hopes and aspirations, it was very protected from what was really going on. Where was Tommy from, if you don't mind asking where? Um, he was from Slovakia. Does he live in Ireland? Or was he yeah, he's in Dublin. 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 There can't be many survivors left. Is there many survivors left? No, I don't think so. He's nine. Yeah, he's nine. 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 A very, as I say, very personal thanks, and I'd like to present to the Garden of Reflection um, a book. It's called Inside Anne Frank's House, um, which I hope you will you. derive um, enjoyment from so um, and Thank share you. with others when they visit. I'll leave this out of a special table during the exhibition, so anybody that comes in can get a chance to flick through it. And it's all sealed up, so I'll have a wee flick through it myself today. Listen, thank you very much to Val. It's just been truly, it's been a wonderful few days now, I must say. And it doesn't actually end here today. The exhibition obviously is here for the rest of the month, up until the 27th of November. We have some of our schools are coming through and they're going to get a guided tour by our wonderful peer guides. We're so proud of them. And Becca's one of our other guides today. And Becca's kindly offered to give anyone who wishes to stay now, she's going to give them a guided tour of the exhibition. And I highly recommend it. If you have 40, 45 minutes, it gives you a, a really good insight. You know, you can go around and read the panels, certainly, but you know, I think to get that personal one-to-one -one is really important. On Saturday, we have, um, Val is kindly coming back to us on Saturday. We're having a special lunchtime event as part of the Women of the World Festival. 
Um, Val's coming back to us. Um, one of our colleagues, Catherine McColgan, is going to be here, and we have Kate, Dr. Katie Radford from the Institute for Conflict Research. And we're going to just have a panel discussion and, and a bit of a conversation around the relevance, again, the contemporary relevance of Anne Frank today. So um, I really would invite you, as many of you, to come back again on Saturday. We'd really appreciate it um, if you could come. So I did turn it off. You're all right. <laughs> it does happen. <laughs> It's the usual times, Dennis, 12.30. Oh, um, we should have sent out a, an email today. Um, so, yes, and it's in the moment of the word brochure. We also have a tree of, um, our tree of reflection, which um, has had a journey of its own down the stairs from the roof. <laughs> Don't know how we're going to get back up again, but anyway, we'll worry about that. I also have a table with little labels. So, um, you know, I'd encourage you just to write some comments. It just can be a personal reflection. They're only little labels, so it doesn't even have to be a whole sentence. It could be a word or two. You know, and come back and spend a bit of your own time with the exhibition. As you know, we're open during the day, and we're happy for people just to come in off the street and, um, you know, take a bit of time. I'm really pleased, and again, I'm, you know, I'm so thankful to the Anne Frank Trust and to Val and for time here this week, and I'm, you know, our Peer guides are young guides. I'm so proud of you. You've done, done a great job. And all of the guides, we had adult guides as well. We've Becca here. And I see Flavio has snip snuck in at the back there as well. So he might help, help Becca give a bit of a tour as well. They did a great job for the last few days. And it was, you know, it's been an experience. And as Vala said, we hope it's a partnership. It's not, it's the start of something new. And thank you all once again for having me. Thank you.